I think we should not prolong the tea any longer uh, so that we can end the conscionable hour and still have time for some discussion at the end. Um, the last two papers, uh, the first one is by Eric Vajrahoff, uh, who is a student in the intermediate school. Um, and then I will speak last, Eric. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you very much for asking me to speak here today. It's a, it's a great honor. Before I begin, I would also quickly like to thank um, Professor Diane Lewis um, from Cooper Union in New York and Technische Universität Berlin and also Pamela Theodor Kopolu from Fritz Neumeyer's department at Technische Universität Berlin who helped um, and tutored with the project that I want to introduce you to. Um, I'm obviously not claiming to be a great architectural theoretic, so what I will do is just um, introduce you to a part of Der Stiel and, and my understanding of it, and some of the quotations, I apologize, you will already have heard today once again. Um, and then I quickly would like to, to show a little project of mine that refers to that. When you are in your mid-twenties, reading architectural theory from the 19th century is certainly interesting, but not always pure entertainment. Thus I was quite stunned and happy to stumble over a footnote in Der Stiel that at first seemed to be very unlike the rest of the text. In paragraph 60, whose title, The Masking of Reality in the Arts, stands out in Semper's otherwise quite rationally argued text, Semper writes, I think the dressing and the mask are as old as human civilization, and the joy in both is identical with the joy in those things that drove men to be sculptors, painters, architects, poets, musicians, dramatists, and short artists. Every artistic creation, every artistic pleasure presupposes a certain carnival spirit, or to express myself in a modern way, the haze of the carnival candles is the true atmosphere of art. At first sight, this ingenious outburst of nonlinear associative thinking does not seem to fit into the context we find it in Semper's well-known dressing theory, where he distinguishes between the constructive wall and the originally textile woven wall, calling the latter one, quote, that architectural element that formally represents and makes visible the enclosed space as such. The woven wall thus acquires primary architectural meaning. Beyond this is the constructive wall, acting solely as, quote, the structure that serves to support, to secure, to carry the spatial enclosure, and thus is technologically indispensable, but architecturally and formally of little importance. As Semper says, the structure was foreign to the original architectural idea and was in the beginning not a form determining element. Therefore, the woven wall bears not the structural load, but the actual architectural meaning that is, as Semper writes elsewhere, ideas and symbolism. But they can only exist with the scaffoldings behind. This is nothing new or unusual, and we have discussed this in length today. But I think it is this little footnote here in paragraph 60 that reveals a Semper beyond the rational materialist that he is sometimes considered to be. His explanation of the origin of architecture from festive celebrations leads him to conclude that dressing and the mask are actually a condition of human civilization. He brings us right into the haze of the carnival candles, and this is where I would like to take you today. As we continue reading this footnote, we find he becomes even more radical. The denial of reality of the material is necessary if form is to emerge as a meaningful symbol, as an autonomous creation of man. <coughs> Semper is about to drag us into another reality, one could even say into the surreal, 
And his harmless dressing theory gains another dimension, which I will now call his masking theory. What is this masking theory about? First, we should look at a text where Semper speaks of the actual mask. In a speech published in 1856 entitled Über die formelle Gesetzmäßigkeit des Schmuckes und dessen Bedeutung als Kunstsymbol, we learn that he really does see a parallel between the actual mask on the one side and his woven wall and the mask of reality on the other side. Semper starts out by talking about Schmuck as the decoration of the body, but, as we would expect him to do, he soon connects it with architecture and ceases to distinguish between Schmuck for the human body and Schmuck as the ornamentation of buildings. He makes this connection by referring to his favorite people, the ancient Greeks. To the Hellene, Schmuck in its cosmic regularity was a reflection of the general world order as it presented itself to his senses in the apparent world. To him, Semper writes, the ornament meant a generally comprehensible, self-explanatory symbol of natural law that is especially apparent throughout the cosmic art of architecture as an intrinsic element of formal equipment. He then actually notes the mask among, among his examples for Schmuck, mentioning Native Americans with their horrifying animal masks. And we find ourselves right in the haze of the carnival candles when he then says, the mask became a very early symbol of veiling of the mysterious and at the same time the easily frightened. Thus, the mask is not only identical with the dressing of buildings, which is the architecturally relevant layer or the woven wall, but it also gains a somewhat supernatural and terrifying dimension, recalling his reference to the denial of reality, which is here on the screen. But what is all this magic about? How does the haze of the carnival candles relate to us enjoying or creating art? As I quoted before, it is Semper's goal to deny not only reality, but what he calls the stoff or material in his footnote, so we can eventually forget the stuff, finding pleasure in pure artistic form. Semper says, let us make forgotten the means that need to be used for the desired artistic effect and not proclaim them loudly, thus missing our part miserably. Through the mask, we will reach what may seem to be a somewhat delirious state of beautiful forgetfulness, drifting into a reality that exists without stuff. To attain this, masking happens basically on three levels. One, it is Semper's typical dressing theory. The woven wall masks the stoff of the structure. For example, the stucco masks the brick or the color masks the gray column. But beyond that, the masking is perfected by using and crafting the material in the most adequate way that makes the onlooker actually forget which stoff or material is used. And, even further, we have to extend our understanding of Stoff beyond its translation as material and consider Stoff as the actual theme or subject matter of the artwork or the woven wall. It is only when we understand the double meaning of the German word Stoff, which can be translated as both material and as subject matter, that we understand why Semper goes so far as to talk about masking the stuff of the mask and quotes Phidias, quotes Phidias sculptures on the Parthenon as an example. This masking the material of the mask led Phidias to his conception of the two tympana on the Parthenon. Evidently, he considered his task, the representation of the double myth and its actors, the deities, as the subject matter to be treated, as was the stone in which he formed them, which he veiled as much as possible, thus freeing them from any material and outwardly demonstrative expression of their non-pictorial and religious symbolic nature. Amazingly enough, by just looking at a footnote, we may have discovered here, hidden beneath the superficial flow of der Stier, nothing less than Semper's central point. We realize this 
in the last sentence of his footnote, where Semper sums up and comments on this entire big project of writing der Stier. How the work of art, in its perception, makes one forget the means and the material by which and with which it exists and has an effect and as form becomes self-sufficient, to show this is the most difficult task of the theory of style. The most fascinating dimension of architectural theory, I think, is its impact on what is actually built, the metamorphosis of words into stone, into concrete, glass, or wood. It is this dimension that provides architectural theory with a relevance that goes beyond beautifully composed essays that are only read by experts. Following Semper's argument, the logical question is, where does all this actually find its built counterpart? Where is it that we forget reality, that we enjoy and create arts in, art in Semper's sense, that we indulge in the haze of the carnival candles? The answer I propose is at the theater. Before coming to the design proposal, I would like to sketch my line of thought on this idea. In reference to his interest in the festive celebrations as the origin of monumental architecture, as I mentioned before, Semper draws the perfect example for his masking theory from the first theaters of antiquity. He writes, in this way, the highly characteristic architectural style of the theater arose as late as in historical times from the boarded, richly decorated, and dressed performance stage." End quote. There is actual proof that this scaffolding behind the stage, which came to be called the Franz Skene, once the theaters of antiquity were built in stone, was indeed dressed with marble. We see this in Robert Walpole's Travels in Various Countries of the East from 1820, whom Semper refers to. Here, we not only find a Greek inscription from Patara mentioning, quote, the building of the Logion and the incrustation of it with marble, but we also see in Semper's exact words a remark relating to the theater at Tauromenium that explains these incrustations. Nudi hodie parietis olum olim tabulatis pictis velcrustis marmoreis fuerunt vestiti. My Latin is quite rusty but I dare translate the now bare or actually naked walls were at the time dressed with paintings or marble incrustations. Furthermore, if we have another look at Semper's text über die formelle Gesetzmäßigkeit des Schmuckes, where he mentions the mask, we are struck by the passage, quote, the mask is logically used as a symbol of veiling to master any threshold, any technical point of connection that would be difficult to solve in an artistically pleasing manner, so to say, by masking exactly this point of connection. The mask had been a meaningful symbol in the arts long before the dramatic art took it over. To sum this up, we learned that at first, the mask was applied as a kind of technological device for veiling, at the same time becoming a symbol thereof, and subsequently, it was taken on by the theater. It is not unexpected then that, returning to the footnote I talked about before, Semper refers to the ancient Greek dramas, where he sees the mask, the theater, and stuff as he understands it, combined in one. This is not the right side. Sorry. Anyway, I will just read it. The oldest vase paintings gave us an idea of the early material masks of the Hellenes in a spiritual way, like those stone dramas of Phidias. The ancient mask is taken up by Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, also by Aristophanes, and the other comic dramatists. The proscenium is used for framing a noble piece of human history that does not occur at some time somewhere, but that happens everywhere as long as the hearts of men beat. End of quote. In front of the encrusted front scene of antiquity, an extremely complex play of masks takes place, which, which presents enormous similarity to Masker Semper's masking theory and his definition of Stoff. First, 
The wall behind the stage is dressed, vestiti. Then the actors are literally masked. And finally, there is the immaterial stoff or subject that is perfectly mastered by the playwrights of antiquity, not unlike a craftsman would master a material, or Phidias mastered the subject on the Parthenon tympana. And that stuff is mastered in such a way that it is actually masked. It is clear that it is in the theater that we find the architectural equivalent of Semper's masking theory. And it is therefore not inconceivable to link Semper to the theater and even to claim that the theater may serve for both artistic creation and artistic pleasure, where art originates and where it is performed and enjoyed. Enough talk about words. We're overdue to read some architectural drawings. From the theaters of antiquity, I would like to take you to the current urban condition of Berlin, where I did the project that I'm presenting. The extensive bombing during World War II significantly altered the typical Mietzkasern, five-story high tenements from the late 19th century that make up huge parts of the city. On an urban scale, the regularity of the block was transformed into a bizarre landscape of single tenements with bare walls rising next to an empty sandy site where once neighboring buildings had stood. On a more detailed scale, the original stucco facades that cover the structural brick of the remaining buildings were often damaged in the war and still have not been fully repaired in former East Berlin. The prevailing idea in post-Cold War Berlin that means in the past 10 years, has been to regard the tenements as being in a state of disrepair on both scales. Thus, the block grid from the 1930s is being recreated by filling the gaps with new versions of the tenement house, and accordingly, the little gaps in the stucco facades are being filled with fresh stucco. Concentrating just on the small scale for now, Semper's masking theory can help to find a more interesting understanding of the tenements as they present themselves to us at the moment, not regarding them as being in a state of disrepair, but rather accepting that the course of history has given Berlin a unique architectural identity. It is in this context that I developed the project I would like to introduce you to. The effect is stunning to see stucco and brick appearing on the facades at the same time we are inevitably reminded of Semper's mask and structure. As he says in the footnote, masking does not help, however, where behind the mask the thing is false or the mask is no good. We can thus value the brick laid bare as what is behind the mask, just as we know there are actors behind the masks in the Greek dramas. Beyond that, the tenements if they are not considered desolate, but actually in their current state as complete, provide a refreshing interpretation of Semper's dressing theory when he once again talks about the Greeks. Here we write. The tradition of incrustation, in fact, prevails above all as a true essence of architecture. It limits itself in no way simply to a type of tendentious decorative adornment of surfaces with sculpture and painting but essentially conditions the art form in general. In Greek architecture, both the art form and decoration are so intimately bound together by this influence of the principle of surface dressing that an isolated look at either is impossible. With these parallels to a Semperian dressed or masked wall in mind, it is stunning to see a section through such a wall from, the 19th, from a 19th century Craftman's book, which is the next slide. This is a section through the lower part of a wall of a tenement, where it kind of slopes out. And even in the form, you can, if you want, actually make out a nose and a mouth, and very easily and stunningly becomes a mask. And I allowed myself to play around with it a bit more. <laughs> looking now at the entire house, actually disappearing behind a mask of stucco. And it's also amazing to see how well, if we carry on with collages, a tenement actually fits as the front scanning of an antique theater. I 
cut out as spandos and glued it into the meat's kazan. The tenements, we find out, provide us with an ideal frontskene and even come up to Vitruvius' requirements. In his translation of De Architectura from 1796, the German architect August Rode notes, the skene represents a Greek house where, next to the apartment of the proprietor, to the left and right there were apartments with their own doors for foreigners. When we look at the tenements, this is a pretty horrible um, drawing, but the only one I have here in London right now. We can see that actually at this actual um, building that are then used for my project, there are, as there are on, on many tenement houses, three doors as well, the big one in the middle and the two small ones to the side, just on a stage of a Greek theater. And <coughs> like this, the design became actually very easy because all that was missing, I thought, were the seating steps. And what I did was just, I chose that one house and um, put a theater basically into the street and cutting into the buildings on the other side of the street um, so that this theater um, puts the Mietzkazan, the tenement house, in a completely different situation with um, the traffic passing, basically, or pedestrians passing across the stage when there's no performance. Thus, what we end up with is a theater, a theater that offers a fresh look at the tenements, at Berlin, and not at least at Gottfried Semper. Thank you. Hmm? Yeah, sure, yeah. Any
material in a, in a, in a, in a slightly different context, and I think also it makes the thing very strong that, 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 that uh, uh, this effect which we see that, that there is another kind of, not only the maintenance of the, of the institution and the, uh, through, through a new material from, 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 from wood to stone, but also hinted at uh, that, that there's the same kind of, kind of transformation of that very subject matter and institution. It's a bit like um, when, when Sempo was talking about the, 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 the picture Of the, of the temple, picking up a certain um, uh, let's say mytholo mythological subject matter, mm. but doing something new with it, releasing it from, and uh, uh, it's kind of just the repetition of the stereotype, but, but, but through artistic expression maybe, it's like a lot of paintings which pick up religious subject matter, but which that's what, what is known, what one can do, but through that very act, you kind of, for instance, in the, in the early Renaissance, you bring in new notions of individuality, but you still draw the Madonna. You have new notions of, uh, of, of the sexes, new, new, new kind of uh, meanings attached to this old stock. And I find that, that, that more recognition of kind of transformative development in that chain of transposition uh, 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 is a um, uh, powerful um, say, interpretation. That I think what's what's um, important about this this aspect of of Semper to me is that, um, as I said, those different translations of stuff. And I think I don't know if I I, I probably disagree with you on um, that material um, doesn't offer enough resistance to be interesting. If I got you right, um, what I find fascinating with Semper is basically that to me. Um, he covers actually topics that I personally am very interested in when I design. And one 
of that is basically the idea and the cultural context it stands in and also the political context it stands in. I mean, we've talked about today that Semper has, was extremely politically active and even had to emigrate. And, and um, he definitely saw always um, society and the political structure as an influence on, on architecture and being expressed in that, in that surface. And <coughs> on the other hand, it is also the material to me because I do think um, that a tactile quality is very important in architecture. I do think that um, sooner or later, of course, you have to deal with the, with the, with the subject of materiality and it may not be <coughs> difficult to master technologically, but it is still um, an important question which material to choose. And so I, being an architecture student and far away from being only interested in theory as theory. Um, I don't mean, you're also, you're also obviously, you're an architect and you have your reasons for what, for what you say, but maybe I didn't also quite understand it, but um, I feel it is very important to connect those two things. I think a building can be, can make extremely intellectual references, which I really liked in your presentation. Um, and it also has, um, tactile qualities, and Semper to me combines that, which your projects also, I'm sure, do have, or I don't know, is that <laughs> an answer? What I, what I find interesting about the stucco is to, yeah, to look, I mean, it was interesting because these buildings were actually built up really, really quickly and then just covered with, yeah, mass produced, mass produced stucco. Um, and I think they're actually in a way more interesting as they present themselves to us today where they are not repaired and where both sides appear at the same time. If you can actually in practice conserve that, that's another point. They're all what, sorry? I totally disagree with that. I would, I mean, these, these tenement houses today are like the most wanted places to live, actually. Like for young people and for students, they are um, often still affordable if they have not been restored yet. Um, so they become like the hip area of town to live in, so to say. Um, they are definitely the center of like the off culture and the student culture and the not established artistic culture. Um, where they have been restored, they're much more wanted than any any EBA flat usually. Um, yeah. At least when you when you compare it to the EBA 87 and uh, and these maybe also to put it in a, in a bit of a context of um, why these tenements. Um, it may seem ridiculous, but these tenements are like a central point in the discussion in Berlin on the large scale, which I did not now elaborate on and I don't want to do that. Um, it was about filling up the block grid or not doing that and I think there's also an issue on, on a small scale and I think the, um, it is not just about the stucco but it is also about, um, as I said, the identity that Berlin gains through consisting to a large part out of houses that are semi-deteriorated under looking at it in the usual usual way. Um, and it thus has also a political aspect. It has an aspect of how society deals with its past. And I think that's what makes the stucco, even though it's like it's tiny and it's quite quite ridiculous at first sight, what makes it quite important, I think. Yes. Okay. Um, look, I just 
Well, I think it's a logistic viewpoint. I think it's interesting that this kind of idea of the facade and the building and the facade of the ethical theater comes together. But I sort of think of it more like a conceptual space for the Definitely, yeah. Definitely. I mean, there was. It sort of makes all sorts of theory of implications. It's not a project. It's not a kind of fine joke form. But it sort of raises important questions and, and discussion. This is, if you remember, discussion as a draft stand a couple of weeks ago about Berlin and kind of conservative rule and kind of closing yeah. the blocks and all those kind of things. I think this provides a sort of openness to the city. And it provides certain questions like what kind of um, opening is that, a theater opening? What, what kind of uh, drama is going to be represented in the city of Berlin at this moment in this particular uh, uh, context? Yeah. I think it opens a lot of important urban questions, which could be linked historically and whatever. And as long as that's that sort of conception of that, then I think it's it, it kind of important. The, yeah, maybe you're right on that. I was absolutely determined. Sorry. <laughs> I was absolutely determined um, that we would finish at six o'clock, uh, and so we shall. But I shall now only speak uh, for about twenty minutes. Um, I started off this morning trying to kind of introduce and give a justification. Uh, for the conference um, in two registers. Uh, how white might we, both within the graduate program but also in the school at large, um, how might we develop a real relation to a range of architectural theory, kind of interrogating it from the point of view of now, as an alternative to wishing to import uh, some kind of mega-meta-discourse um, 
as if the problem with architecture is that it's always already on weak ground uh, and needs to be restored by a strong kind of discursive foundations. Um, and I think, in a way, the, uh, the day's been very productive in those terms. Uh, if only really because of some of the differences between people. The second question, which for me is kind of part of the same question, is the question of how, initially, as a graduate program, but also in the school as a whole, and I think here, of how general studies, uh, which is entrusted with the, the task of representing, I'm not going to call it architectural history, I would rather say the past of architecture. Um, and here we find, in a way, that one of the major obstacles which confronts us in dealing with the past of architecture uh, is precisely the post semperian category of style. That is to say, uh, in his increasingly hostile attacks on Semper, Regal begins to lay down the foundations of a notion of style, of Kunstwollen, which in a sense becomes the dominant formation for art history and as a consequence for architectural history. Just let me try and kind of unpack that for a moment. In a way, the development at the end of the 19th century of art history requires some element, apart from anything else, through which to deploy a narrative. And obviously, one of the main contenders for that is the story of style in painting. Uh, the history of style. Now, what this means is that art historians um, begin to tell the story of art in terms of the establishment, the development, the decline, the decay, the replacement of one style with another. Uh, in a way, which becomes kind of tautologous. I mean, it, on the one hand, it, it, it gains the ascent uh, of a student. So you will compare two styles, um, and you'll compare them, first of all, in words. And then, as Verflin was the first to do, put up two slides uh, on a screen, who's the first, I think, to use two at the same time, and say, look, you know, there's the Renaissance and the Baroque, and everyone goes, gosh, yes, it's just like you told us. Um, this becomes a kind of fundamental, almost kind of inescapable trope for art history. I think it's done enormous damage uh, to the discipline of art history. But that's like their problem. Um, our problem is that it then really spread uh, like a secondary kind of outbreak of a disease into architectural history. And the major way in which architects are taught architectural history is still in effect. I mean, as it were, when, a, when asked to put on a survey course, this will always be the that the point of reliance that the lecturer feels compelled to fall back upon uh, in telling the story of architecture. And it's about the life of the style. It's about when it's born, whether it's how far east into Czechoslovakia it got, whether it declined earlier in Belgium than it did in southwest France, uh, whether some bizarre bits of it went on in Naples a bit longer than anyone had recognized till recently. It, it's, it's this sort of diagnostic chart of Europe as to the rise and fall uh, of styles. In a way, at a certain point, the only discourse which arises 
um, to oppose it, I suppose is what you might call the social history of art. That is to say, one which proclaimed itself in its kind of early 20th century Austrian kind of origins as really uh, writing a history of art in which art is internalized not so much within the category of style but within the category of society. The problem is many of the same things actually kind of return uh, because what happens essentially is you get a reduced um, and precy like history of society of which then, in Hegelian fashion, the art and architecture is thought to be an expression, stroke, symptom, whatever. Uh, that there, there is some kind of isomorphic relationship between, in effect, the history of style and the progress of society. Between these two, uh, particular damage has been done in respect to architectural education because neither side of these two discourses really have much to offer the architectural, the architectural student. They don't ask the kinds of questions that might be asked. They don't ask because, as it were, it's not just a question of style, but it's a question of this thing called history. They can't interrogate uh, buildings for their relation to the past, which itself might be an enormously various question. One's, one's thinking here, it's not so much what was the immediate precedent for this building, but it might be what is Corb's relation to the Acropolis? I mean, that's what I mean you know, when one shows the sheer width and breadth of the question of the relationship between architecture and its past. Its past is almost, as it were, you might think, kind of paralleled to the past of a patient kind of on the analytic couch. You're not saying this is everything that you can say about all the relations that have obtained in the past about architecture. One is saying this is a certain thread which in some way comes to represent the promises and the obstacles of the present. Let me go on actually just to push that a bit further before we might be able to kind of cash it out pedagogically. What I would say here is that the past of an architecture, which an architectural school ought to set itself the task of teaching, is the past that is required by what it is doing in the present. Right? There isn't some objective past of architecture, some um, ultimately given series of questions and problems which must organize any student interested in education, there has to be some notion of a contemporary and a current project which itself is able to set the agenda of the past. Now, that, you know, the, the point is at this point you always find, you always kind of see architects nodding and historians kind of looking, oh my God, you know, this is appalling. Uh, this is the worst kind of kind of nominalism in respect to the past. But one's treating it from the point of view of architectural pedagogy. Let the historians do as they may, do as they please, represent architectural history in any way they want. That's, in a sense, their problem. It's not necessarily the problem for an architectural student, student nor for an architectural school. In that sense, it's actually a claim for a certain kind of historiographical pluralism. <clears throat> because if what I say has any kind of point, uh, different schools would gradually begin to develop a different historiography, a different representation of the past. This, I think, would be of enormous benefit to everyone. It would enormously clarify 
as it were, the terms of the debates and enable students to see what is it in the process of their education is at stake. One problem that we have in architectural education is that very rarely do students come to any view about what is at stake. One's not here making a point about what view they ought to take or not to take, but as it were, the idea that there are crucial decisions at stake is not something really which is presented to them with any pedagogic force. That's really the kind of first thing I wanted to say about how destructive uh, academic history of art has been in the formation of architectural students. And let's be honest, we all know what the outcome is. I can put on course after course here on classical architecture and the Renaissance architecture, and there will be two people in the course. Until we make the past directly relevant in the sense that I've outlined, you will not persuade students to go to those courses. The theory component of undergraduate degrees uh, will remain in the minds of the student permanently tacked on as if it was some kind of punishment, as if it was like sort of detention. Um, this, of course, is not true of all students. Some students will take to it, but I'm talking about an absolutely recognizable phenomenon, an absolutely recognizable malaise which runs through architectural schools and it is, is attested to. And all forms of official lamentation about this will do nothing until the student is shown what is at stake in the past. That's the first point I want to make. The second, and this bears, uh, so in a sense, I mean, one of the one of the resources which we do have is a notion of style, kind of in semper, which absolutely opposes that way of reducing to a fluent narrative uh, the art historical discourse. In that sense, style for semper is not only a kind of what Marx would call synthesis of many determinations, it's a stylus. It's an instrument. It writes. It's not something you kind of varnish on. Uh, it's not like what happens when you're feeble-minded. Um, it's what you. It's what you cut with. A second point, which is kind of perhaps more theoretical is one which arises, I think, for anyone who's listened to discussions here over the last few years. I mean, God knows there's not altogether a consistency uh, to the arguments and discussions that you have. But nonetheless, it's possible now and again to pick up the odd wish or the odd word which seems to have a kind of uh, excessive demand within it. I would suggest that one of the terms that's floated around, often emanating from people of apparently quite distinct schools of thought, is the notion of the architectural effect. Um, over time, I can remember Jeff Kipnis wishing always to have a theory of architectural effects. And that's not kind of the only place it's, it's emanated from. Now, what would, what would an architectural effect be? And like, what resources might we have? Might it bear some relation to what Semper calls practical aesthetics? Now, when I read out this quotation from Semper, please immediately forget the word beauty. Um, 
I don't want you to be misled. The magic by which art in its most varied forms and manifestations makes an impression on the soul so that it is completely possessed by the work of art is called beauty. This is not so much an attribute of the work as an effect in which the most diverse moments within and without the object considered to be beautiful are simultaneously active. When I say forget the word beauty for a moment, I mean it's there initially simply because we're talking about aesthetics, uh, the discourse on the beautiful. We're not talking about, about beauty here being one and only one effect uh, which might be had upon the subject. What is at stake in Semper's view um, is that the fact that this is not so much an attribute of the object but is an effect is as it were a topic which needs both to be theoretically developed but also in some way uh, to be the object of a certain form of pedagogic research it seems to me in collaboration of both the student and the teacher now, first of all, let's try and kind of rule out one or two things that it couldn't be. It can't be, and this is the first problem for all those who want to propose a notion of architectural effects, it cannot be a set of psychological effects which are engendered by objects. All right? Now, just let me kind of explain briefly why you cannot convert this problem of architectural effect into some general psychological speculation on the relationship between objects and subjects taken in a psychological register. Most obvious objection to it, of course, <coughs> is that the psychological effect on subjects of objects is incredibly various. Uh, I mean, is manifestly what, what kind of sends you into ecstasy fills me with kind of horror. Uh, you want to stay there, I want to get away. This is merely to point to the difference between human subjects and a certain relativism which has to attend to any argument based upon human psychology. So the problem there exactly the problem that Kant faced in the 18th century. The problem there is, is precisely that you can't convert, you can't produce a psychology of effects. You can't even produce a psychology of building effects. Even if you were to say, well, let's just kind of limit this to buildings, because there is an important distinction here between architecture uh, and building, if not necessarily the usual kind of philosophical distinction. Let's go back to kind of Kant and aesthetics. The subject, who is the subject of aesthetic pleasure, that is, of capable of finding an object beautiful, but by beautiful, we here put under a kind of beauty here stands for the totality together with the varia variability of all effects. <laughs> the subject must go in a certain frame of mind. What in general call, uh, Kant calls disinterested. Right? There's no point kind of thinking that I go in an aesthetic frame of mind to a picture if really what I'm deciding to do is to whether to buy it. Now, one actually has to kind of construct, I think, some sort of parallel, however artificial it might be, about architecture. That is to say, you in some sense have to go to experience architecture. Right? 
It's not something that happens viscerally. It's, in some sense, a determination to do so. After all, one's not unaware of the subjective processes where that form of concentration becomes possible. But it's not just a question of concentration. It's a question that certain perceptions become relevant, chiefly the relationship between this object and other objects of the same class, architecture. That is to say, one is immediately uh, relating one building or object with another as, as a consequence of being able to bring an architectural disinterestedness to bear. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if something of the remnants of the notion of aesthetic pleasure can be brought to bear on the ob object with the intention of beginning to map, as obviously the sublime does, a set of kind of variant possible effects upon the subject, but within the discourse on architecture as a form of subjective consciousness, then it seems to me one might begin to be able to discuss the question of the way in which what Andrew's been talking about, the object and its effects are synthesized in the subject. It would be an interesting problem, as it were, to sketch out pedagogically how one might do that. At the moment, I think, in the AA, <coughs> we have the beginnings of a systematic way to do it, which is to insist, uh, however partially and however much we fail on a day-to-day -day basis, to insist that students encounter works, in a sense, as case studies. That is, one by one. One by one, so that they can be dealt with as a synthesis of many determinations, but kind of gradually built up into an internal repertoire of reference. This actually, to go back to the first point about the past, would in principle enable students during the period of their formation as a student to come to know a reasonably large number of buildings, okay, while it not having been delivered to them in this packaged form of elements of a history of style, where I debate with you about the stylistic relationship of Michelangelo and of Raphael. In this, it would seem that elements of Semper's kind of theory of style uh, would have quite a kind of generative set of possibilities. Semper himself had strong views on education. Above all, he was concerned that students would not develop a formation which was deformed either by pseudo-practicality, which was what he thought was an effect of learning science as a set of propositions rather than as the outcome of personal research. The second was the deformations uh, which occurred in the marketplace and the way in which academic institutions were in Germany adjusting themselves to that market. And the third was the problem of academic hierarchy, the way in which the formation of students is dulled by the professional position of their teachers. Now I think we can kind of internalize all three uh, as perfectly kind of sensible pedagogic rubric. But I think it's really in the question of, of style, of going back before the moment when Regal gets hold of it, 
that we might excavate not just, as it were, the intellectual validity in an isolated sense of Semper's notion of style, but whether there aren't certain pedagogic devices which one might be able to invent through reattending to him. I'm sorry, I'm five minutes late. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? Paul. I was just thinking about how many Greek books there were on historians. The interesting thing is they should have read perhaps a little more philosophy of history. Mm. I, I think that's right. I mean, when I was first a graduate student in art history at Oxford, I worked on the project of the late Bob Delesse, which was to, to map the production of late medieval manuscripts in the Low Countries. Uh, and he had a personal refusal. He'd been thrown out of the Musée de Beaux-Arts Royale in 68. Uh, just managed to get himself um, a chair at All Souls, of all places. Um, and was met in the aftermath of 1968 by A.L. Rouse approaching him and saying, Que les Francais sont ingouvernables. Um, so he thought he'd come to the wrong place. Uh, as he developed this uh, mapping of illuminated manuscript, he absolutely refused to use that form of pseudo scholarship, which meant every time you had a little illumination that you liked, you called it, you know, by the master of the small table. Um, uh, and if you didn't like it, you didn't call it a master. And if you like two of them, you said, that, one, that one's by the master of the small table as well. I mean, not only does this rest on vacuous scholarship, um, as we see from Berenson onwards, it had an extremely intimate relationship with the art market. Um, he was prepared to do it kind of workshop by workshop, in town by town. Um, for which the Art Bulletin referred to him as a vulgar materialist. Uh, well, you think, you know, if that's vulgar materialism, give it to me any time. Uh, I, I really do think that, that, that generations of people um, have had the interest drained um, from the study of the past of images, objects, um, buildings. In, in a way, the types of objects that Regal talks about, at least you can say, are lucky enough not to have been touched by the condescension of the English uh, in terms of a lot of historical work. But I also think one, one, one has to simply say, in, in a very fundamental way, that the, there, there simply is no reason why academic uh, architectural history is the relevant discourse on architecture and its past for an architectural student. Patrick. I absolutely also subscribe fully to the notion of um, defining a uh, historical research on the basis of current promises, obstacles, problems, etc. Um, but also, you also, I guess, must recognize that, that, um, that the way these problems uh, are recognized as problems, so particularly if you talk about problems, you, you, as you said earlier, they will be defined in terms of the threat. I also I, 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 I formulated problems already conscious for the consciousness to a certain extent um, in, 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 in developed society, for sure. Um, um, and therefore, there is also that, I, that, that 
Socially, well, yes, but let, 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 so so we have to be we have to be able to 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 reckon that um, uh, when we go back uh, into history with 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 the problem in mind, we are not rewriting we we, we we were rewriting history on the basis of what has been written. Maybe not with this con with this with this problem in mind, and therefore we redeem it or we build on it, and we always already kind of are new with it. So that that's it, I think, and I think also. Um, therefore, I mean, that the uh, one hypothesis I always have, heuristic hypothesis, when, when looking at the history, is uh, with Hegel to say the rationality of formativity of what has occurred, even of, and, and therefore, I mean, a suspicious one takes off a huge lump. social institution or uh, practice uh, and calls a mistake um, 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 I find kind of worrying, although it, uh, um, um, this is a methodological question. Well, I mean, yes, I mean, but I don't, I mean, I don't at that point perhaps kind of share. I mean, the, the point about Hegel is surely, I mean, nothing's ever wasted uh, in Hegel. Okay. Um, that is to say, one can be one can be confronted with a a monstrous what I'm calling kind of mistake, uh, and correctly deciphered. It it requires, as it were, uh, only the application of the right form of intelligibility to set it back up on its feet, um, and kind of get the process going again. I think the problem is almost everything, almost everything's wasted. I mean, I want to insist here that, that apart from anything else, uh, historically, architecture is a highly discontinuous kind of project. I mean, in that sense, when framing the problem uh, earlier on, Andrew said, you know, I, I think it is possible to, you know, carve out of what other people would call architectural his course, uh, architectural history, a discourse kind of from Semperon, which is about the surface. And I'm sure that that's right. And there are many such histories in architecture, but they're discontinuous and they don't totalize as architecture. Um, Therefore, you know, one, one has to, in a sense, uh, always be um, kind of deconstructing the totality of architecture, a totality given by reference to its origins or whatever. And at the same time, saying, but there are, within that, definite discourses, uh, even if they present themselves you know, not as a highly unified field, but as sort of what Foucault would call a kind of field of dispersion. Um, I mean, I, I do think that here possibly, kind of methodologically, something like uh, Michel Foucault's Archaeology of Knowledge is actually quite a useful kind of resource um, in dealing with these kind of elements. Uh, about which it is possible to write a history. The point of, I mean, unlike Andrew's account, the point of, of, of trying to, to articulate this uh, through the insistence upon subjectivity is, is not just out of some commitment to any kind of subjectivism, uh, but in precisely the way in which Semper's pedagogy is constructed, that, that the, the process of education, he says very clearly at one point, must be done without any external compulsion. I mean, he's not talking about deadlines. Um, it, it, it is precisely that, uh, especially in respect to natural processes, he can see that the, the training of people to have scientific knowledge 
in the 19th century becomes a kind of problem for the architect when it becomes simply a series of propositions rather than, in a sense, the experience which always at one level exceeds the proposition, the experience which comes of having kind of internalized it, internalized precisely this notion of being in the grip of and partly in control of something which is a synthesis of many determinations. Now, I think there are lots of problems with Semper because in order to, to elaborate that, you know, he, he has to insist uh, very highly on the individuation and the externality and the internality of the object in ways which precisely may not be helpful uh, in thinking of a kind of architectural field now for students. But those are kind of secondary issues. Sorry, can I take Maria? I would say Well, it would seem to me a logical, I mean, uh, this would be for Andrew to answer. I mean, it would seem to me a logical necessity that in order for what he argues to be the case, right, there has to be somewhere where it's kind of synthesized as an effect or as an experience or as a principle of intelligibility, something. Uh, it can't just be there. I think it can. I think you, the, the whole Kantian, uh, the, the detour through Kant brings you to a, what I think is a fantasy and also where I think it differs very much from what Andrew was aiming at. I, I think what, what we're talking about in terms of the architectural effect, the kind of, let's say, the work of the surface of the ornament, the symbolic operations of a certain entity is not, uh, i.e., let's call it the architectural effect, which we are interested, let's say, is not the, the effect which is uh, a disinterested connoisseur of an architecture as art um, um, uh, um, <coughs> kind of relationship, but it is precisely the kind of, let's say, the um, subcutane, the kind of the, 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 the half-conscious being Lived the lived the lived moment of uh, where, whereby the uh, certain certain necessary decoration uh, kind of maintains a certain type of family relation. Let's say that is the architectural effect. I would argue, and it and an ornament is very much part of that uh, because because you require uh, you can't have that let's say innate concrete right right. Um, 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 I think that's what we're talking about, and not. But it's not a question. It's it's not at that point. It's not at that point either Kantian. Uh, that was not an experience. In the uh, it's certainly not about. Something. It's certainly not about connoisseurship. Um, I mean, you know, again, I mean, if you like, I I, I can put it in kind of Marxist <laughs> terms <laughs> when Marx says that you know, how is it? that the subject is, under, is capable of comprehending a process which itself is a synthesis of many determinations, it is because that is the form of the subject. That is to say, it, you know, it shares the same form. Now, I'm not basing myself on that argument, 
but I mean there, there are a range of arguments uh, through which one could do it. Nor, I hasten to add, you know, is this some sort of, nor do I wish to try and um, uh, kind of qualify Andrew's point by kind of wanting to put the, the, the kind of supplement of the subject in there, right? Uh, Are you saying the special relation has to be concentrated in, in the intent of appreciating architecture where that's the, that's the, that's the kind of uh, set up the architectural effect. I'm saying I'm not interested in that type of architectural effect. That is a kind of, um, you know, I'm interested in the, the, the permanence of always already being kind of uh, uh, operated through architectural effects. Sure. Not this moment in the museum where. Uh, look, look, if you're talking about architectural pedagogy, you see, I, I'm talking about architectural practice. Now, the architecture may begin indeed in the haze of the candle. A very long process of rational uh, operation lasting maybe five years, and he has to know how to play the piano. He has to know how to create the object to effect. He may fail, he may succeed, but this is actually a very deliberate technical process at all levels. And therefore, it's like an actor. You know, an actor may appear to be natural. He may appear to have an effect. And just be himself or the character. But in fact, every move is calculated and rehearsed and understood, self-conscious um, process, if you like, of manipulating the audience. But this is, what, this is what the architect has to eventually arrive at in order to be effective. And in pedagogy, this sort of disinterested understanding of the architectural machine, if you like, this is how I understand what you're talking about, that, that you student has to sort of dissect the building, really, like a corpse, and eventually understand how it is that it affects him. 